Until the launch of AMD's Radeon RX 590 a few weeks ago, things seemed to be quiet on the company's graphics front. If you've been paying attention to the workstation side of things though, you'd actually see a bunch of AMD people hellbent on making sure the company's graphics solutions are as good as they can be, and more importantly, that people know they even exist. I give AMD props for its efforts here. I follow some Radeon Pro people on Twitter, and I'm regularly treated to great examples of what can be done with ProRender. I don't even need to look that far, because these people are so passionate about what's being done, they happily share what people are doing with the company's rendering solutions. That said, when I was attending SIGGRAPH this past August, I made it a point to ask every designer I bumped into if they had heard of ProRender, or better yet, used it. Unfortunately, too many people actually did tell me they've never heard of it. But that's a situation that will improve if AMD keeps on its current path. If you're not familiar with Radeon ProRender, let's quickly get you up to speed. Like many competing renderers, ProRender is a physically based unbiased ray traced renderer that gives designers the ability to develop hyper-realistic models and scenes on the cheap. But ProRender's free cost doesn't mean that it's an inferior solution by default. AMD seems to be totally committed to ProRender's development just as the pre-existing commercial providers are. Since the original ProRender release, it's gone on to support Autodesk 3ds Max and Maya, Dassault SolidWorks, Unreal Engine, Cinema 4D, and even the open source Blender. I love using Blender as an example with ProRender since the two combined make for a no-cost way to get into physically based rendering. Even some of the official Blender projects can be converted to ProRender so that you can get started working with the renderer pretty easily. For almost all of our ProRender testing, Autodesk 3ds Max is used as the base. But where performance is concerned, whatever applies to 3ds Max will largely apply to ProRender in any other design suite, which is to say, the scaling should effectively be the same. So let's get to the point of this video, which is a look at ProRender performance across a big selection of modern GPUs. Those include some gaming GPUs in addition to the workstation counterparts, such as AMD's Radeon RX 580 and Vega 64, and Nvidia's GTX 1080 Ti, RTX 2080 Ti, and the Titan XP. There's also a dual Titan XP configuration here to gauge how well ProRender handles rendering to more than one GPU, and similarly, CPU plus GPU heterogeneous tests have also been done to paint a fuller picture overall. Since the question comes up every video, we unfortunately do not have a Radeon Pro WX9100, which is the only reason one's not included here. We also don't have Pro Duo or Frontier Edition, and believe us, we want those results here just as much as you do. We're largely at the mercy of what AMD and Nvidia want to send us, and once in a while, they get weird about certain models. That should also explain the lack of Titan V and Quadro RTX here. There's not too much else to note here aside from the fact that the latest version of both Autodesk 3ds Max 2019 and AMD's Radeon Pro Renderer plugin was used. And with that, let's get to the results. There's a lot to dissect here, so let's start from the top. Clearly, NVIDIA has one hell of a good thing going with its Turing RTX GeForce graphics cards. The 2080 Ti dominates everything else in the chart, including the dual GPU configuration. Technically, that shouldn't be the case, and I feel like it wouldn't be if ProRender used NVIDIA graphics cards a little more efficiently. It could also be that NVIDIA's own driver lacks ProRender optimizations, we're really not too sure. Either way, with NVIDIA's placement in this chart, it's not as though we're being held back in comparison to the competition. Even though Titan XP is a bit faster than the WX9100 on the single precision front, two of AMD's top cards are likely to outperform two Titan XPs here, since ProRender is unsurprisingly optimized on Radeon Pro. The situation isn't at all bad on the Nvidia side though. Back in April, dual Titan XPs performed worse than a single Titan XP. Despite the green team's cards being involved here, we assume this improvement was made possible by AMD's continued optimizations. Ultimately, Nvidia rules the roost here, hogging the top 5 spots. In 6th place is the Radeon RX Vega 64, which improves upon the WX8200 just a little bit. The new WX8200 performs almost identically to how a Vega 56 would in most cases, but here it doesn't fall too far behind the Vega 64. For sanity's sake, none of the players based WX cards or the Quadro P2000 are in any way ideal for pro render work. 644 seconds might not seem so bad for a GTR render, but you must bear in mind that our tests are not done with production level quality. Complete renders would take 25 times as long, or even more for really complex scenes. I mentioned before that ProRender now supports heterogeneous rendering, so it's not like we could tackle ProRender performance and pretend it didn't exist. When we first tested the feature a couple of months ago, we actually saw worse performance than we did when we only rendered to the GPU. But fast forward to today, and the situation seems to have improved, at least a little bit. With the CPU introduced into the rendering process, some of the placements change up a little bit. The RTX 2080 Ti drops from the first position to second, surpassed by the dual Titan XPs. The Quadro P6000 managed to outperform the Titan XP as well, which is another reversal from the original graph. Given how some of the scaling changed after the CPU was added to the mix, it's hard to figure out why it's happening. Did the dual Titan XPs somehow become more efficient with heterogeneous rendering? Why did a GPU like the 2080 Ti see vastly reduced performance in the GTR render? 
Here's a direct comparison between the GPU and CPU plus GPU. Some of the faults in testing can be seen here, such as how the 2080 Ti managed to get worse performance once heterogeneous rendering was engaged. Meanwhile, Titan XP performance barely changed, but dual Titan XP performance gained fairly significantly. On the whole, ProRender doesn't seem to love NVIDIA GPUs too much, but that's not necessarily the fault of the renderer. It could be that NVIDIA itself could optimize performance in the driver, but I'm not sure the green team is even concerned with ProRender performance right now. And it's not like the company has much to fuss over, since its GPUs are dominating these charts overall anyway. As we look at these results from the bottom up, it becomes clear that the beefier the GPU, the smaller the advantage adding a CPU would give. That's not the case with all renderers, and change performance will of course depend on your choice of CPU. Our 18-core might exhibit gains in areas where an 8-core 9900K wouldn't, for example. We decided to test the 6-core 8700K with an RTX 2070 since that PC was close to see if the situation changed at all. In this test, the G4's RTX 2070 managed to render the project in 2 minutes and 52 seconds, whereas the heterogeneous render took 3 minutes and 25 seconds, or about 19% longer. Clearly, this is not optimized for NVIDIA, but it is for AMD. Again, I'm not sure why it's so poor for NVIDIA, but it's something likely to improve in the future. I hate to bring another renderer into this discussion, but to highlight the differences of performance scaling, I must. Here are the results from testing the same heterogeneous feature with Chaos Group's V-Ray earlier this year. In the same system that this video's Pro Render testing was done in, the WX3100 was 219% faster with the CPU plus GPU render than it was with only the GPU render. In V-Ray, the P2000 proved 448% faster with GPU plus GPU over GPU only. Could this be the difference between a renderer which was developed from the start with CPU support and one that was built from the start with only GPU support? Probably, but that's not to discredit AMD's efforts. We've already seen major improvements over the past year, and we see nothing to suggest that things won't keep improving. The focus of this video has revolved entirely around performance, and since this was a performance look, that's probably fine. However, there's a lot more to ProRender than just its performance. Why you'd want to check it out is because it's free, open source, and physically based. This OpenCL renderer isn't just for Windows either, but also Mac OS and Linux. Currently supported suites include 3DS Max, Maya, Cinema 4D, SolidWorks, and even Blender. As lightly covered earlier, with Blender and ProRender combined, you'd have a 100% free and open source PBR solution, which as far as we're concerned is pretty awesome. As we've said a few times before, ProRender continues to get better over time, and this certainly won't be our last time taking a look at the renderer. And with that, we once again thank you for watching, and encourage you to subscribe to the channel to help us grow, and to of course keep in tune with our latest content. Cheers, and see you guys next time.